Computer. Three. Go. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. This is Corey Thompson from Above Board TV. <laughs> And this is the pod father of gaming, Stephen Bonacore. You are listening to Board Games Insider, episode 339. And we're recording this on October 10th, 2024. That's 10 10, 2024. Board Games Insider is proud to be powered by Board Game Geek. Corey, <laughs> man of world travel, how are you, buddy? Oh, man, I am tired. I can imagine. Uh, I have been traveling all over the place. Uh, we did the live, uh, the live recording, which was so just insanely impromptu. Uh, we were all over the place. I apologize. You it know, was a stream of consciousness. Literally the worst <laughs> recording that we will ever I have know. on this show. The two of you. I mean, you know, you can't do this without me, effectively, right? At least admit that for the rest of the audience, Corey Thompson. I, I predict it is our record-breaking biggest download episode. <laughs> so, uh, obviously, I was at Spiel, which was yeah. amazing. Before that, Helsinki, and before that, Iceland, which were so fun. Um, Spiel, though, it was nuts. I mean, this was a record-breaking Spiel. We'll talk about that. Yeah, oh, but my God. We're insane. Given the first day of Spiel, that Thursday was the first to sell out and it was a holiday it was hard to walk in the halls but it spiel incredible i have behind me here just bags and bags of games that i brought <laughs> of course back. you do because right now i'm still not home i am in maryland so I am spending a little bit of time uh, with friends in Maryland. There's a great gaming community here. So I'm visiting um, Elizabeth Hargrave, hopefully. Oh, yeah. Uh, my friend Marion, uh, who works for Gen Con. Um, a whole bunch of people. Really interesting one. When I was in Helsinki, I reached out to one of my favorite designers, Sammy Lasko, who has done, did a uh, Dale of Merchants, which was followed up by Lands of Galzir and Peacekeepers. And uh, Dale of Merchants is one of my very favorite games. I reached out, said, hey, uh, you're living in Finland. I'm in Finland. Can we get together? We've never met. And he said, oh, I'm really sorry. I've got, tra I'm traveling. I've got family things. And it turns out his family things are in Maryland which is That's exactly funny. where I am now. So I'm going to get together with uh, Sammy Lasko, Finnish game designer, uh, while I happen to be in Maryland. Well, you just which happen to I'm be there. I'm really <laughs> excited about that. And, and, uh, and where are you going next week? You're going to go see me. We're hanging out in Orlando next week, I, right? I mean, tentatively, I was going to come to Orlando. <laughs> yeah. But I just, Wanted to know if Orlando was still around. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's fine. We'll talk about the hurricane <laughs> in one second. <laughs> I just want to give a quick shout out, though, to uh, one of our listeners, Ben Stein, who uh, I don't know if you remember when I was sick and had uh, like a face thing. He reached out with support and advice and he's in Maryland. So I'm hoping oh, it's to nice. get together with Ben and uh, maybe do a, a little uh board game insider get together that uh, unfortunately really... it'll it will have already happened by the time this airs i wish i knew ahead of time to do more planning but you know planning is not my strong suit as you can tell by the video last week planning is not your <laughs> strong suit uh trying to get people together you know in 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 weird locations like you know having a bgi okay meetup that <laughs> a bgi meetup in essen did you have a meetup for our fans no if i was there we would have had a meetup. I, Technically, I saw fans. Yeah, and, you did. Uh, I saw Ignacy. That was a meetup. <laughs> That's a meetup. So over here at the Pod Father of Gaming, we marked ourselves safe from Hurricane Milton, uh, which uh, literally blew through um, the center of the state yesterday. It was a wind wow. event here. Only really strong winds. Nothing happened here. A little bit of rain. Not much more than a even a mid to bad storm. Uh, there were, however, tornadoes in a lot of places within 
10 miles, 20 miles of us, incredible. And some of them were serious tornadoes. Florida, South Florida has never seen wow. that before, which was really weird. I watched all day on the local ABC affiliate shout out to WPBF down here who were, they were like incredulous on how many tornadoes were active, like at the same time in South yeah. Florida. It was crazy, but n everybody's safe here. There was some some damage and there was some loss of life in uh, Port St. Lucie at least. Uh, so it was a little bit sad about that, uh, but we, we are okay from Hurricane Milton and we'll talk more about that plus Hurricane Helene, which was only two weeks before that at, on the panhandle. Um, as I mentioned uh, a little bit implied, um, uh, Corey and I are gonna be hanging out in Orlando together. We have, uh, just Yay! a small small gaming event that, uh, that uh, we're doing over there, gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, for an extended weekend. Can't wait. Um, then from after that, uh, two weeks later, yeah, uh, we're going to fly up to Boston for Lobster Trap. That's I'm a, so jealous. Oh, that's, man. That's another one of these, like, 30-year-old gatherings, you know, modeled similarly on the Gathering of Friends, uh, also run by the same person who now runs the Gathering of Friends, good friend Craig Massey. Going to keep invited... I said I had to go, so we're going to fly up there. And then immediately from there, well, we're going to stop in Salem because it's Halloween time. We're going to go see the witches. <laughs> then we're going to fly directly to Dallas uh, for BGG Con, which is always a huge event. Corey, you'll be there too, right? I'll be there. I'll Excellent. be there. Love BGG Con. It's just, you know, it's like a, it's just like a serious, you have the one of the biggest libraries in the country in one of the nicest hotels to be gaming in. Just a lot of fun. I got a, a big shout out to Aldi and the whole team. Jeff Anderson runs the thing. So uh, if you ever get a chance, go to BGG Con. Um, spend a little time at home. PAX U. I'll see you there as well, I think. Right? Yep. yep. I'm Excellent. planning on it. Good. And then over to uh, over for Christmas uh, with the family in New Jersey. Um, and I'll see you there too. No, you will not see me. You're not. <laughs> No, <laughs> you're more than welcome to hang out with my family for Christmas, but I wouldn't recommend it. They're, no, you know, no, it's they're a little pass on that one. A little too Italian <laughs> for you. That I'm okay with. I'm used to it. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's uh, you know, I also mentioned I give a shout out uh, to Play to Z since we're both in involved. Um, at Essen, uh, Zev had a very successful Essen with the first booth for Play to Z uh, outside the country, and he was showing off links. King's Coalition, Kaleidos, and Euro, which is probably the biggest of those games that are going to come out this year by Play to Z, but it missed yeah. the show. It missed the show. <laughs> it was stuck in customs. Customs so. issues. There was a lot of companies that had customs issues. Yeah. It was a familiar story. It, it it always is. It always is. But check those check those games out. Euro has been getting a lot of buzz. I keep getting people saying, can I get a review copy and things like that, which I send them over to Zev. Zev will take care of you. All right, everybody, let's get now to the event deck. All right, so we have talked about the spiel. Uh, you guys talked about it last week. Uh, you yeah. talked about it again now, but we have to put like a bold yellow highlighter, the whole thing on this because the spiel sold out. It sold out on never, all levels. Never happened before. Right. The exhibitor yeah. space sold out uh, earlier in the year. They completely used all of the space for the exhibitors. Also it never happened before. Never happened. Then as we got close to the show, the Thursday passes sold out. Obviously, biggest day, the the, the crazies run in. Got to get that game. Holiday. It was unification day for Germany. So we knew last year that the holiday would fall right on the first day of Spiel, but I had no idea how ridiculously crowded it would make it. Uh, it's, I mean, for Thursday to sell out, first is amazing and i i think it was the busiest day of the four yeah it, it, it usually is walk. it was it, it usually is it's usually very hard to walk you have to figure out what's your path to get to a bathroom at any given time and <laughs> it's 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 pretty crazy when you're trying to walk through those halls spoken like an old man spoken like an old man <laughs> and but but for those people who have perspective on like wow gen con halls can be crowded no much more crowded to get through these halls, especially the big halls one, two, three are the big ones. Um, so the Thursday tickets sold out. Then the four day tickets sold out. Then yep. the Friday Saturday, tickets, and I then think Saturday, and Saturday, then Friday, Friday and Sunday. 
sold out, not a ticket to be had and um, by middle of the show. Tons of people who normally would come to Spiel and just buy tickets on site, a lot of them got turned away. Uh, this has never happened before. A lot of a lot of people show up to Spiel without pre-ordering their tickets, and it's gonna gonna kind of turn into a different world now. It is. It really is. I have a feeling they're going to be doing a lot more pre-sales uh, now, next I year. I want to do one other piece of insight just to tone it down a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, for a very long time, there actually was no maximum attendance for Spiel. It never was defined. Uh, but this year, there was actually uh, some uh, German laws passed, which set a maximum. So a little bit of Spiel selling out is the fact that this was the first year legally there was a point at which it could sell out. Uh, but it is record-breaking how many people came. So not only was it record-breaking attendance, but now there actually was a law about how many can show up. Right, right. So the next story is actually very big news um, uh, in the industry slash for any individual gamer listening to us. And that is that Stonemeyer Games has acquired the game and all of the series, Tokaido. This comes out of yeah. ICB2, and this is something that Corey and I were privy to a little beforehand, uh, but let me give you some of the uh, the highlights that were released. So Mario Games has acquired the Tokaido brand and games from FunForge. The acquisition of Tokaido, one of FunForge's flagship brands, was revealed by Stonemeyer in their most recent newsletter update and shared with the public at Essen Spiel 2018. 24. Stone and they Meyer, had copies for sale at the uh, Stonemeyer booth, which was really interesting. Already branded Stonemeyer Games, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Stonemeyer CEO Jamie Stegmeyer said he saw Tokaido as a good fit for the Stonemeyer's focus on Euro games for one to five players. Funforge wants to focus on new creations and the development of unique intellectual properties. Stonemeyer has already begun production on the Stonemeyer branded version of the base game. The new version will include an autonoma solo mode, which will also be available separately for people that already own the game, upgraded components, a rulebook revised for clarity and accessibility, text on some cards and the character tiles, and the reference cards for each player that explain the locations. So this is re- this is really big news. Um, so it it yeah. appear- appeared that FunForge was not doing well. So this well, uh, FunForge actually did, uh, I believe, went bankrupt a number of years ago, and it kind of disappeared for a while. It had a slight saving grace, and it reappeared at Gen Con and started selling Dokaido Duel, which was their newest title. But it it looks like this is a means to help save the company. Very cool. Very, very cool. Yep. And Takedo, uh, by the way, the brands there also include Namiji, and the press release says Namiji is also part of this deal. Namiji and uh, Takeda Duel were very recent Kickstarters, which had trouble delivering because of various issues within FunForge. Right. So the next couple of stories, maybe even maybe even three, um, are regarding the hurricanes that have just happened. And the first one is Bink which is the Book Industry Charitable Foundation, um, is gearing up to help retailers affected by Helene, not Milton. But this literally... Literally happened yesterday. Yesterday. I guarantee it's going to be the same thing once yeah. once the, the, the dust settles, so to speak. Exactly. So, um, so uh, they are raising money as it gears up to help retailers affected by Hurricane Helene, which was in which has inflicted major death and destruction across the southeastern U.S. and other disasters. As a starting point, Macmillan Publishers will match all gifts, regardless of size, up to a total of $10,000 for contributions to Bink. As of Tuesday morning, Bink had already received 15 calls for help from book and comic people, with many others presumably still unable to communicate due to cell tower damages and other disruptions so i mean i love when i read these stories it just shows how wonderful um the hobby in general the greater hobby of comics and games gets together to help each other out during these crises and this is wonderful absolutely we're a relatively small hobby all things considered and uh there really are just a number of stories of of companies uh doing just amazing stuff so and and feel good and to and to emphasize exactly what you just said, also on I 
CV2, Mad Cave Studios donates $10,000 for Hurricane Helene Relief. Florida-based comic and graphic novel publisher Mad Cave Studios has donated $10,000 to Bink to support comic and book retailers impacted by Hurricane Helene. In its announcement, Mad Cave noted stores closed in St. Petersburg, Asheville, and Black Mountain due to water damage and power outages, and the countless other bookstores and comic stores in Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas, and beyond facing critical challenges. So again, more people coming forward, um, and this is a, um, a, a reach, I'm, I'm sorry, a, um, a publisher of, of comics, and they're based in Florida, so they're helping out people in the area. Really, Fantastic. really cool. And this was all uh, with regards to Hurricane Helene. Um, there's also started to be stories about Milton, which landed. Did it land yesterday or it landed? It day literally, before? no, it literally landed yesterday. Yesterday. And passed through throughout the night, was going across the central portion right through uh, Orlando, from, from Tampa ish area, Sarasota area, yeah. through Orlando, and is now in the ocean. Took t- so less than 12 Board hours. So, Wire posted a story uh, about R&R Games located right in that path that they evacuated their headquarters um, and are, are hoping for the best. So, And I'd like to point out that their headquarters, which is in Tampa Bay, which could have been very badly yeah. damaged, is Frank's house. <laughs> Frank DiLorenzo is the uh, <laughs> CEO of, of, uh, of R&R. Him and Dan are brothers, and they're both principals in the company. Great guys. Um, and I'm glad I spoke to yeah. both of them today. Uh, Dan is also, Dan's in Port St. Lucie. He just moved down. <laughs> Perfect timing. He just left New Hampshire to come down for a hurricane. And Frank has a condo in Orlando. So he got his house got hit, but it's okay in Tampa. Good, and good. Uh, yeah, that's as far as we know so no, far. Frank and Dan are great guys. Yep. Uh, Dan had actually reached out and asked me to look at and play test a couple of games for him. So uh, I'm glad they're doing well. Yeah. And for the record, Play to Z did not evacuate their studio, which is Zev's house in Naples, Florida. Uh, he's <laughs> And he's fine. I checked in with him multiple times yesterday. We, we have... <laughs> We have a text chain. What about chain. the voluminous office space for uh, Podfather Incorporated? Uh, Podfa- do, okay. Podfather Media Group is fine. The media conglomerate. The Podfather Media conglomerate. Oh, by the way, yeah. You know, I should announce right now that the Podfather of Gaming LLC is actually a thing now. I just. Oh, my goodness. I, I did that for a particular reason. It's a. I'm not going to get into the why I had to do that, but That's I did so that. Funny, if man. you go look, you can now look that up as a Florida-based LLC. It's true, but I, not monetizing myself. It happened. It's for protection. Protection. It's a thing. It's a corporate thing. Anyway, what do we have here, Corey? You took. You take us through this one. Open Owl Studios is partner partnering with Tempest Games. This is a really interesting one. So. Opal, uh, Open Owl Studios is a relatively new studio that has a number of high-profile Kickstarters. They did Mythwind and they did Stone Saga, both really popular, um, larger games. Uh, and they've announced a partnership with Tempest Workshop. Tempest is a new company formed by former members of Prospero Hall and Funko Games. Because you remember when Funko was bought up by Goliath, they dissolved uh, Funko Games to an extent, but also Prospero Hall, their design studio. So uh, the two studios, Open Owl and Tempest, are collaborating on a unique board game project set for release in 2025, which will be brought to life through community-focused crowdfunding campaign. So it's really nice that these two groups have found each other and are having a uh, having a new uh, project in the works. That is really, really cool. We also have um, an interesting story from Titmouse <laughs> Animation Studios putting out now, their first RPG on Backer Kit. Well, Titmouse is a, a really prolific animation studio. I'm a big fan of them. They've done a lot of the television shows for Adult Swim. They also did the critical role animation uh, Vox Machina. Um, they And they have created a what they call a fantasy role drinking game. What? So this is a very simple uh, drinking RPG. And they play it up as 
very simple. The game is called Drunkards, Druggies, and Delinquents. Oh my god. Uh, and it is... <laughs> there's a huge title in the middle of the campaign that says, basically, you just roll dice, fight monsters, and drink. <laughs> I, I I have no words for this. I'm, I um, it if, is nuts. I I totally agree. If it's that simple, I, I you know you know I, I'm 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 pro having a good time, but I you I know I don't. The biggest part of this story is the collection of artists that they've gotten together. Oh, course, that's right. Tit Mouse is a huge animation studio that's done a lot of very famous things. So their list of artists is incredible. They have Pendleton Ward, who's the creator of Adventure Time. They have Jenny Goldberg, who worked on Invader, Z Invader Zim. They have uh, Chris Pernowski, who is the founder of Titmouse, but also the creator of The Legend of Vox Machina. Uh, the list just goes on and on. There's got to be 20, 30. Ben Edlund, who created The Tick. Um, Will Carsola, who created uh, Mr. Pickles. Uh, it, it's a story artist from the Steven Universe series, Ian Jones Quarterly. There's so many amazing names attached to this ridiculous project. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I can't make a judgment on, on it without really having seen it. However, um, it uh, doesn't sound like a lot of game in this box. So, no, I mean, you know, <clears throat> full warning this is a project, yeah. this is an RPG project with tons of, yeah drinking drug reference all the goofy stuff but it's meant to yes. be light and goofy there you go the last thing that we'll talk about right now is uh icv2 play to z was mentioned play to z to release Yero. um and we're not i'm not gonna get into it you know we don't talk about releases however of course we talk about play to z it's near and dear yeah, to both our hearts yeah. Yero y-r-o if you if you want to check out one game by play to z that's the game. It's getting the most buzz. Like I said, it missed Essen. People we would have sold yeah. a lot more. But um, it looks beautiful on the table. It plays in 30 minutes. Um, you're like playing anthropomorphic kind of characters and things like that. It just, just looks like it's... I got a chance to play it at the gathering. Liked it very much. Good. Um, cool. You're biased. Cool but that's cool. <laughs> I'm less biased than you. <laughs> I don't know what that means. We're both investors. I'm a, I'm a, you're the... You're the damn like ceo or something chairman I'm just a, i don't do any work I, I do nothing at all i'm just a silent partner chairmans don't work <laughs> they direct all right everybody let's get over to strategy and tactics all right we have a couple there for ignasi which we'll skip for now but uh friend of the show jeremy baker uh he's at fancy pants very nice, I Jeremy. Love that. Yeah, uh, Jeremy is a wise guy for the record. So just listen to these the things here. I've been accused of asking stupid questions, so let's get to a couple of serious ones. All right, Jeremy, let's see where this goes. One, Corey, what gear are you guys using over at Aboveboard, and what wow. is the turnaround for videos? That's kind of a that's a very big question. I mean, obviously, you're not going to get down to the the we, yeah. individual like routers, but like. You know, at a high level, uh, so, what do you got there that that? Well, let me let me let me phrase it a right, little bit different. Right. But what gear do you do to make the videos that you do? We know you've got some cameras that are incredible. They don't go to Iceland uh, to go to a thing. We you got no. some stuff that is not used for the commercial, the consumer stuff. What do no, you we, use for the consumer we stuff? Are, we are a full film quality uh, studio. We can do television and movie quality stuff. We film in 4K. Our cameras are a combination of Komodo Reds and Black Magics. Our system, we have a uh, Sisu robot that can move the cameras in three-dimensional space. It keeps track of its position in space through Pixitope software and Stipe. It feeds into a Silverlight uh, supercomputer system. We use the Unreal Engine to integrate uh, AR, that's um, alternate reality, green screen technology. So in real time, we can superimpose in uh, computer graphics that will respond to the movement of the cameras. We record everything in 4K. We generally edit in DaVinci. Our turnaround time, we have a full team of editors that are professional working editors within the industry. It varies tremendously, but it's on the order of a few months. 
Did I answer that already? You answer that very well. <laughs> and my commentary will be, you know, in IT, you know, my, one of my former lives, we sure. have an amazing amount of techno babble that rivaled any techno babble that I've ever heard from IT people. So, and I toned it down. And you toned it down. Stephen and Ignacy, well, we're going to put you in this, actually, because uh, this is not specific to Ignacy, but he wanted to put Ignacy in this. Stephen and Corey, uh -oh. as a huge YouTuber himself with under 400 subscribers, don't act like you don't wait with bated breath on my <laughs> releases. I do, every I'm, time. I'm, I'm always looking for a hole in the current video space. Currently, two years before this is read on your podcast, BS, it's actually only about 10 months, I've been reading one-star reviews for top games on the BGG Top 100. What type of videos, I guess that's what he's doing as part of his content, he's been doing yeah. reviews that have gotten one star reviews i i guess that's what he's saying i like that i think that is a pretty good niche of trying to find low review games and objectively reviewing them what type um, of videos do you think do we think are not being created and can be exploited by me i mean by content creators what do you think Corey? i mean is this i mean is there something out there like that i mean that's interesting is it and i'm not exactly sure what jeremy's saying is he saying that he finds bad reviews and then kind of goes through them? I, what i'm hoping is uh doing what some other people have done which is to find the very low rated games and give them objective reviews and talk about what's good and bad about yeah. them um it's no fun just to take a really bad rated review and bash it and just say yeah it deserves to be bad but yeah. it's fun to find these untapped games yeah that's that's i think a market that needs more look is finding games that people don't know about so it's yeah. going to be the ten thousand that were under on bgg it's going to be some of the the low rated and why was it low rated and what's good about these right. um maybe they're the first games from known designers or known artists or the first ones coming out from publishers or near misses from people that we know well I think that's a that's a great untapped thing. I'm yeah, not so, going to tell him the other untapped things because I've got to use them myself. <laughs> you got to put them on your podcast. But no, sir, yeah, but I I mean, I agree with you. Um, and I, that's not what he's doing here because he's talking about the top 100. But I think, Jeremy, a really good idea is to go and look outside of what we all talk about, like the, the new hotness, the new this. Oh, this is great. Oh, we, we found this. No, find a... If I look behind me, right, and people who are watching me, they'll see hundreds of games behind me, and there are thousands of games in in, in this wall of games and shame, a lot of shame back there. Um, <laughs> but find and the I've ones... suitcases full. <laughs> and he's got suitcases of shame and games. So find those... I would, as I mean, if it's just thinking, kind of riffing on Corey, pick games that no one knows and talk about those and why they're good or bad but mostly find the ones that are good i like spreading the love of games why is this game not why has this game not gotten love and talk about it like that i think that's a niche versus talking about the latest release from essen from gen con from origins etc so that's what we would say and the other question of course he got he gets back to his crazy you know stupid questions you said it jeremy i didn't um how many board games tall are you Wow. Um, so um, what what is the standard thickness of a Ticket to Ride box? Two and a half inches. It's about 55 millimeters, I think. Um, two and a half it, inches. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to look behind me. So hold, <laughs> well, hold on a second. So in Ticket to Ride boxes, let's see. Yeah, uh, two and a half inches. But it might be um, it might be 72 Um uh, 72 millimeters. I forgot that it's they're like two, 290 by 290 by 72 millimeters. I, I am think that's exactly it. 28 ticket to rides tall. You're, you're 28 ticket to rides tall. Um, uh, I'm uh, uh, one second, I'm doing you're my not prep. You're not ready. How would I know this? I didn't know. Uh, I'm so, gonna guess you're what so, six, seven ticket to rides point. We said two and a half inches, right? So I'm <laughs> What did you say you were? 28. 26.4 ticket to rides. Yeah. There you go. I'm 5'6, give or take. 
I can't do that in millimeters or, or centimeters, guys. Sorry. 20, uh, five foot, six inches. That's 26.4. I, love that. I think I, I think I want from now on to only discuss measurements in board game boxes. Now, you know what? Maybe that's the universal thing. The Americans can't take up metric. The Europeans can't do Imperial. Let's just talk board game boxes. What do you think? Works for me. Works for me. <laughs> All right. Uh, what do we got? How are we doing on time here, man? Nobody ever looks at the time anymore. Only Ignacy is the deal. Let's go to Andrew Walters. Uh, he's at Dusty Shadow. Of course, BGI is the greatest board game related podcast out there. And of course, Dice Tower Now as well, which was Thank you. Uh, which is no more. Uh, no, no question about that. And congratulations on episode 300. So he gave us this in December of last year. But I have fear of missing out on some other good board game podcasts out there. Out there, I've listened to about 30 different shows over the last year, but I could be missing some other good shows. What other podcasts do you recommend, Corey? Wow. Well, let's start with the Nerd About Show. Fantastic new show, right? <laughs> we just started Nerd About, which is basically myself, Daryl Andrews, and Benita Cower. And we travel a lot, so we're doing a travel show about geekery and board games and all sorts of fun stuff traveling around the world. So I look, I, I, I look it's forward a for my invitation. Really, it's, uh, it, we've only had like five, six episodes, so it's a little early to judge. I look forward uh, I was, to my invitation on the show. Say Secret Cabal. Secret Cabal is a wonderful long form podcast. Right. It is long, so it's like two, three hours, and I, I consume it in chunks. Um, shut up and sit down. Great group. They do really funny stuff. Uh, what's on what's on your list, Stephen? <laughs> yeah, so absolutely those two shows. And Secret Cabal guys have been longtime friends and strong yeah. games used to sponsor the show for many years. Um, uh, my short list would, un would include Blue Peg, Pink Peg. Big oh, shout so great, Big man. shout out to Rob and Christina and the gang there. They're just such nice people. And they do a great job rolling dice and taking names. That's, <laughs> I make I make a joke about them. That's Marty and the other guy. I actually said that once on the air. <laughs> and it's and it's had like Marty and Tony, great people, really good content. Um, Fantastic. And, and one of the longest shows, longest running shows out there, maybe the longest running major podcast out there is on board games with donald dennis and and uh, eric dewey uh who are also friends of the show and friends of mine and they they are both industry insiders as well they uh, eric listens to this show uh and uh, they just have amazingly good content um reviewing in in a in a fun way games Donald's a little more curmudgeonly and Eric's always very polite and nice. And it's, it's just, I, it's just a really nice show. I want to throw one more out there. Uh, this game is broken. Absolutely hysterical panel style show with uh, friends, uh, Dave Luza um, and with Paula Deming, the Murph brothers. It's, it's really fun. So I enjoy that a lot. Very cool. Lal Margu from Luxembourg. Big friend Who of the I show. bumped into at Spiel, so we oh. finally met face to face. I, and he he informed me I have met him twice at two Spiels in the past because I didn't know who he was and I wasn't even sure it was a man or a woman as I read his questions sometimes. But he reached out to me sometime in the middle of this year and said, "By the way, we've met. Here's the picture." I'm like, "Oh, that's you. Okay, got it." And you know, you never know. Um, first. Thank you for the wonderful mugs I won for my last three questions offered by Corey. Second, congratulations <laughs> for the clever idea of moving your podcast to BGG. Yes. Wasn't that clever? That was a Bonacore idea. Anyway, <laughs> and now for my new question. Don't feel his ego. <laughs> you do not give me enough credit, Corey or Ignacy, for my creativity. What? Let's we quit. talk about you quite a bit. That should be enough. In the nicest way possible all no. the time. No. Yeah, no, correct. <laughs> how expensive is the production of this podcast? This is an easy question. And how do you manage to pay the costs in the past? How did and how did you manage? And is there a change now that you moved to BGG? Corey, how much does it cost to put this podcast up and out all the time? I know I'm paid upwards of what six, seven hundred thousand dollars per episode. Oh, uh, well, for the talent fee that was 
yeah, we, you know, that was the, you know, starter salary. You were an intern. We had to give That's you a little bump. Yeah. You know, I'm, yeah. we're, I'm at the 2.5 million and Ignacy's a, a little, you know, he's under that because he we, come <laughs> that are, do we have costs? We, we have one cost. We pay That's our it. editor who is now your son. Can, yes. we, we can say how much it is, right? We're allowed I to. think so. You're not. Yeah. It's $30 per episode and we get away cheap. We really do. That's on the low end of what it should cost to do editing on a podcast. And as you can see, the video is not edited. I take it. I put it up. We send the audio over to, it used to be Joshua. Before that, it was Matthew. Before that, it was Gil. Now we send it over to Jake, Corey's son. And every 10 episodes, he bills us. And we're now, we're now starting to split it evenly. I was, uh, I, I think, if Ignacy is agreeing to that. So we split it evenly. Um, I was paying a little bit more. And Corey wasn't paying anything until recently. But I figured, you know what? If he's going to he's gonna free have, if he's gonna have this nepotism, <laughs> you know, by hiring his son, he's going to start paying. <laughs> Seriously, just yeah. a huge thank you to Joshua, who yeah. was so nice. Through he was great. All thank sorts you. of, you know, good times and bad times while we were sending our our audio and thanks to jake for picking it up on short notice absolutely absolutely um and i don't think that there's you know, just to finish the thought i don't think there's any cost to actually post the podcast i'm not 100 sure about the fee on the fee on the web page fee on the libsyn yeah there's but well I, we have a web page right we have a web page yeah. is does libsyn even charge that if, if so ignacy's they might paying not. it not yeah so the costs are very unknown. Low. Yeah, the costs are really yeah. low. We do and, this for fun. We're not and, looking to make money, and, the, and we're <laughs> and the quality of the podcast kind of reflects that. No, I mean, hey, I, hey, hey. I think that the quality of the I'm content, a professional, the content quality, I think is as good as anything. I think we we serve. I'm not trying to stroke our egos. I'm really not. But I think that we serve a niche in the content creation out there that nobody else does. We are industry insiders and we want to unravel this industry for you our listeners and watchers on the podfather gaming youtube channel i hope you enjoy it enough to stay with us rod graves from canada he's at buckaroo uh does a game need a mechanism to determine a clear winner in the case of a tie if there is a rule breaking if there's a tie breaking rule how much time do designers put into making sure it is the most fair result how many levels of tiebreaker are reasonable before it wow. gets to the point of being pointless so this is when, this is such a loaded question it is it is because no matter what we say people are going to hate us for this one but um uh, let me go um it, to me does there have to be look it's a game you can make it up yourself too um no, but a designer should probably put some thought into yeah. it because gamers want to know who won. The share the victory thing, at some point, you have to share the victory. And if you're playing in a tournament, they're going to put it down to seating position even. That would be the final tiebreaker yeah. if it's not defined. There, there's a couple games out there, like some classic Uva games, that have literally six or seven levels of tie-breaking rules. <laughs> And yeah, that's probably getting a little silly, but I do appreciate a game yeah. having a tiebreaker rule, uh, at least one. I I think that's a good idea. I do too. I do too. All right, Corey, do you think we should uh, we should call it I now? Think what do you think? Good. Yeah. I think we should call it. Let me put a little next week in here so that I know where we ended, and let's get over to play testing. All right, Corey, it was your question. Please, it was. please tell us what what you wanted this question, what you wanted so answered. My question was, how much more do you like Corey than Bonacore? That was and not the was question. Overwhelmingly positive. Everybody liked Corey better. Oh, my God. I live in my own fantasy world. Don't burst my bubble. <laughs> we, just so, had light, we just had light flicker here. Uh, I'm in South uh -oh. Florida. So, <laughs> no, it, it's probably a very transient thing. Go ahead, Corey. Tell right. us what the real question was. The real question. Two episodes ago. You could go out to eat or get a drink with any board game personality. A designer, developer, publisher, artist, influencer, anyone in or game industry adjacent. There might not even be any games played. Who are you going to pick? Yeah. And, and we had some fun little rules like don't pick us. That's kind of silly. We're not looking for, oh, man, you're the best. Uh, just who would you pick? 
Sure. And we, we really didn't want ego stroke, though. Greg Senko said always that he already had dinner uh, with Bonacore and Gilhova on the Podfather cruise. So that was and really nice. Of I him will to- say there were quite a few. Well, of course, Bonacore, but since I'm not allowed, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, Which, <laughs> that's yeah, nice. You have to do it for him. He'll cry if you don't. Yeah. Conan <laughs> Daly, uh, Conan Daly uh, uh, said that um, he'd love to have a chat with Quentin Smith of Shut Up and Sit Down. He seems like yeah. he'd be really interesting to talk to on a whole range of topics. And I'd love to pick his brains about what makes a board game, LARP or RPG fun and some of the stuff that they cover on People Make Games, his journalistic gaming YouTube series. Um, to be honest, I think I'd mostly lean into his RPG experiences, and I'd love to hear some of his stories. He is a funny, fun guy. All the people over yeah. at Shut Up and Sit Down they, so good. I recently got to be friends with Matt over there, and we just, yeah, we have a great time. When we're really together. good guy. Chris Dupree says very quickly, Joe Mangianello. Mangi- Mangi- oh. Manginello, that's how you say it. Joe Manginello, Hero Quest or D&D at his game room. He he's is a way nerd. into D&D. He's a he, super D&D nerd. He's a super nerd. He's just one of us, and he's, like, ripped, and he's huge. <laughs> he's cool. <laughs> he could beat you up if he doesn't like you. Oh, it's, it's so great. It's he, did, you find, did you find any good ones? Yeah, I, I really, Christian K said maybe Carl Chittick, one of my absolute favorite designers, and I've never seen an interview or anything with him. I love Carl Chittick, and I've I've met him. I've said a few words to him, but I agree. You just don't see much out there. Um, I'd like to see more Carl Chittick interview stuff. Ben Stein says that he would enjoy meeting Isaac Childers. Uh, not only do I love all things Blue Haven, but I majored in physics in college, and I'm intrigued that yes. Isaac has a physics PhD. I would ask him about his training and experience in physics. And uh, he would tell you. Yes, he, he, <laughs> he would. Isaac's a I very... I absolutely love Isaac. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's a very he's, shy and reserved guy. He's the opposite of, like, me but but he is a very warm-hearted guy his wife Amazing is lovely dude. yeah anything else you found that you uh, liked john canost i think i'd like to join jamie stegmeyer for a meal he seems really down to earth and uh like he'd be easy to strike up a conversation with so uh i would pretty cool a personality in there yeah uh kevin martin i would choose the married design i would choose the married designers like Inca and Marcus Brand from Exit Oh my series. God, that's number one on my list. Number I one bet, on my list. I bet their story is fascinating. How fun it would be if we were able to complete an escape room together, then have drinks after. Well, that's a great, that's a great, great answer, Mark. That is Thank fantastic. You. And I've been wanting to hang out with Inca and Marcus for, they are my top designers. Very cool. Peter so, Woken, a uh, friend of the channel. There's too many awesome people to pick between. Since you did not specifically... Uh, specify living or deceased, I'd go for Sid Saxon. That That's amazing. Sid is uh, like the father of American board gaming, has so many titles under his belt, unfortunately has passed away, but that, that would be an amazing dinner. He is, without a doubt, um, in the, the pantheon of great American designers, uh, um, yeah. you know, I, who I, started it, he literally started <laughs> it all. Absolutely. If you get a chance, the Strong Museum of Play has Sid Saxon's diaries, and they are they are a trip. Uh, be remiss if we didn't mention the Mad Halfling, who wrote that he wants to have a, a meal with Ignacy's cats. They've been mentioned on the podcast <laughs> multiple times. They're definitely board game industry adjacent. So that is uh, great. I have not had the pleasure. So Corey, <laughs> you gave us you gave us next week's question. So why don't you? Because no one else that? will. That's true. We didn't have one. This is a very interesting one. Um, I rephrased it a little bit to give it a little more easier for people to like you know figure out mine. something to say. I, what is I your can't. question? It's mine. I did this. Go for it. So, what is the strangest, weirdest, most different board game theme you've ever seen? And. Are you attracted to this theme? And are you in general attracted to themes that are really weird and different? See, I found this absolutely fascinating, um, this question. And I can't wait to hear what people are going to say. I, I, yeah, yeah. I have I will mine. say for me, I have mine. Go ahead. Go for it. Uh, let's just say I have a top 10 poop games list. Oh, my God. And one of the games on there is just 
a really good game called Pecunio Non Olet. And this is a game where you are a Roman latrine operator and you are trying to efficiently run people through your stalls and make money. It is guillotine with a really weird theme and better Euro design. It's a very cool game. That is amazing. So um, mine is a game that I, I discovered this year, and I have talked about it on the show, and I talked about it on the quad, uh, the show on Board Game Geek, and that is This War of Mine. Oh this my is God. literally the most depressing game you will ever play I, and also the most intriguing amazing, game amazing i cried game. i yeah. cried while playing this game i played it at the gathering of friends it's good, horrific good yeah. friend bill bricker uh who, who, who loves this game um he he played it there play it multiple times but it is an amazingly well done game so, then i just believe it's the first game from awakened realms also that was like their first or one of their very earliest games and just to just to remind people what this is about this is about living through a war as a civilian and trying to survive it was done yeah. um, for the kosovo uh conflict i believe i believe that's what it was done for originally and it's, it's not living through the war as a soldier. No. The people who are innocent bystanders just just living in the cities that are under war. And I can't really talk about it deeply because I will start crying again. It's but 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 it's so it's so amazingly done. And you know, the you work or place to do your actions in various locations of your home as you move your rubble around because it keeps getting bombed, things like that. And you have to go out during the day or at night to scav it. Uh, it's unbelievable experience. Unbelievable now, experience. Love the game. You know that it's based on a video game. I do know that, which I hear and is an amazing video game. I'm not sure if you know, but there's a version of the video game, and this will make you cry, I don't, where oh, here you we go. only play as the children. No, no, no. All right, we're going to move right on. Yes, mm. I've heard this, and yeah, no. Can't talk it's, about it. I really am fascinated with social statement board games. There's quite a few board games that you can't really say are fun to play, but as a social statement, they are so powerful. But but the funny thing is, yeah. this game is fun. It's a well done game. It's really it's, good. The 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 conflict and the torture within this game. It's I'm hard pressed to say it's fun, but it's an experience I have to have. Yeah, and it's. It's an incredibly designed game. It, it really is. Uh, check it out. That's my answer. But guys out there, please go to our guild on BGG and find this thread. Um, with this question, I have just created that thread, and we want you to answer it and see what your favorite, weirdest, oddest, oddest, weirdest, strangest theme is. Tell us about it and tell us why. You got ours. Talk to us. Now, let's get to the final scoring. Dun, dun, dun. Thank you so much for listening. Help us spread the word about this podcast by telling your friends to download Board Games Insider wherever they like to get their podcasts or watch Board Games Insider on the Pod Father of Gaming YouTube I think I channel. Read it better than you do. Do you want to be part of this podcast? You can. First, go to our guild on Board Game Geek and then become a member of the guild if you're not. And then you can ask us questions for the strategy and tactics segment, answer our question to you from playtesting simply by posting in the correct thread in the guild. It's really easy. I promise. Please just do it. And I've decided to be a bit more brief here with all the websites and socials. So please <laughs> interact with us on social media. And amazingly, it's basically the same handle on all the platforms. So for Facebook, Twitter, X, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Please go to at Board Games Insider, at Portal Games US, at Podfather Gaming, at Dice Tower Dish, at Play to Z Games, at Above Board TV, and at Nerd About Show. Come follow us on your social media of choice. Speak directly to us on all of these platforms and check out our websites as well, which go by the same names. A special call out to our YouTube channels, which are the bread and butter of really what we do. Uh, and those are Portal Games Studio, The Pod Father of Gaming, and Above Board TV. We would really love to see you in person at an upcoming convention. So if you come to one of the ones we're going to be at, the ones we talk about, and there's a whole bunch this year, please do find us and let's chat. We really live for this. Board Games Insider is professionally edited by Jake Thompson. 
Thank you, Jake, for being part of the team now. And also that great voice you hear doing the intro, the outro, and in-between segments is that of Ray Greenlee. He can be contacted to do voiceover work at raygreenleevoiceover.com. Corey, that brings us to the end of another show. Is there anything uh, you would like to mention to our lovely listeners out there? I don't know where I am. I don't know what time it is. I don't know what day it is. And I'm not even quite sure if I'm awake. But that's the joy of travel. That is the joy of travel. And, uh, you know, we do talk a lot about travel on the show. But, I mean, it's part of our lives. And it sounds like like you're listening to this to be at least part of the industry and part of what we do. And uh, traveling for us entails being at game events about 80 percent of the time it's just literally i'm not on vacation Absolutely. well i'm on vacation but i'm at a game event and i'm going to tell you about sure, it sure. how wonderful it is so thank you all for listening we really appreciate it we'll see you next week on board games insider thank you everyone see you later Al.